Okay. Hi everyone, welcome to our first Wednesday for October uh, with uh, COLOV organized jointly by COLOV and the Department of International Development at Maynooth University. Uh, my name is Eilie Stillen and I'm delighted to be here this evening chatting with uh, Gavin Titley about his book, Is Free Speech Racist? So uh, I'm, you're all very welcome to this discussion and uh, we'll have plenty to talk about as we go through. Just a few little housekeeping things before we get going. Um, as you know, COLOV is the Association of, of Development Workers and Volunteers in Ireland. And COLOV organizes these first Wednesday events um, every Wednesday in the autumn and in the spring. And uh, it it's, uh, streams them live through its YouTube channel. So uh, we'd ask you please to subscribe to the channel and to share the links uh, live while we're streaming and anything that you could you might want to comment uh, through social media while you're at it. And as you do, then lots more people will be able to participate. Now, because we stream it live, it's not like a regular Zoom meeting where everybody can participate actively in it uh, in terms of speaking. But what you can do if you'd like to do it is to make any comments or to ask any questions in the YouTube chat. And if you do that, then that'll be handed over or passed over to me. And if I see them there, I'll gather them and we, I can put them to uh, Gavin. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Gavin Titley from uh, the Department of Media Studies at Maynooth University also. So it's great to be working with a colleague this evening. And um, Gavin has written a really interesting book um, among his other uh, titles. In this case, it is that we're going to look at is, is free speech racist? And I know that this is a topic of great interest to many of Kolov members and supporters and those who are concerned with all forms of racism and who are active in anti-racism and pro-human rights or solidarity struggles. And uh, I was telling Gavin earlier on, I've been reading his book over the last week or so, and lots of different um, points that he makes have resonated with me. And I, just, I think that lots of people will find it very interesting some of you may have read it and others may not have had an opportunity to read it as of yet. Um, just a few things that kind of come across from it to me. Um, and some of these issues, I'm sure Gavin will talk to us a little bit more about as we go along, is this idea that free speech kind of predominates over as a right over all other rights. And that basically, I suppose he challenges the idea that you can say anything you want in the name of free speech. And he questions assumptions about racism and uh, this idea that racism is somehow a thing of the past and that we're all living in a post-racist or uh, racial society now. So he questions lots of different aspects about racism, including the notion that racism is just an idea, bringing to, to the fore the kind of policies, practices and, ex uh, and exclusionary tactics and technologies that are related to it. So there's lots of really interesting points that he raises about it, um, including kind of, I suppose, just often taken for granted notions about, you know, it doesn't really matter what we say because it doesn't have effect. So um, I'm not going to say too much more about it, but I, I found it very interesting and very challenging. And uh, so I'd like to kind of, I suppose, uh, address a number of themes that um, Gavin brings out in the book. Uh, with him this evening. The first thing, though, I'd like to ask you, Gavin, and just to say welcome, uh, mm. is can you tell us a little bit about why you wrote the book? Maybe you might like to tell us about your background and why did you want to write this book in the first place? Yeah, thanks, Edish. I mean, it, it's a short book, but it's it's sort of a, one that comes out of uh, multiple frustrations and and obsessions and, and and scores that I wanted to settle and all of that kind of thing in a way but actually I think it comes out of of two um, sets of sets of concerns that I have you know as a, as a, as a researcher scholar but, but also um, um, as somebody who you know, looks to be involved in in initiatives and, and in activism also so two things that I noticed coming 
together that I was kind of interested in. Um, the first was, I suppose, looking at just this endless proliferation of debates about free speech, um, endless. Um, and again, you know, everybody's quite familiar with the cliches around this at this point, you know, highly platformed, highly remunerated, uh, people with, high, with very, very sort of um, expansive public platforms who are declaring free speech crises that you can't say what you want anymore, that free speech is in some kind of crisis. And I suppose I have a, I have a lot to say on that sort of political form and we can get into it as we go along. But one of the things that um, struck me about that and I was interested to, to start to think through is that when we have these debates about freedom of speech, we have a lot of focus on the question of freedom um, and the, you know, the, 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 the limits of speech and these kinds of familiar debates. But we don't talk very much about speech. Uh, and I do work in a media studies department and I'm, you know, I'm interested in, in communication. And so one of the things that, that I find interesting and that I also found frustrating was that these debates about you know, the, the supposed crisis of freedom of speech have really started to proliferate in a context of abundant communication. We've never had a noisier, busier, more, more, more fractious uh, uh, public sphere in that kind of way. So that's a point I think I can come back to, to later on. And then I suppose in terms of thinking, one, one, one of the things that I've been interested in over the last few years is the way in which the sort of intensity of debates about what racism is and who gets to decide that in societies that you know stubbornly imagine themselves as being post-racial, as having had racist pasts that have been overcome, and therefore racism is regarded as something which is evil, but more or less consigned to the past. And yet these are societies that are characterized by endless debates or very cyclical debates, very spectacular debates about what constitutes racism and you know who it is gets to decide that. So what I wanted to look at there or what I became interested in is how these debates about freedom of speech were having a particular impact on these debates about racism and serving to amplify sort of racializing logics. And also, of course, when we think about one of the points of entry that a lot of people have currently to these debates about the far right and reactionary and authoritarian political actors, the way in which free speech is being used is also amplifying and extending racist politics. So I suppose those are the kinds of things that interest me. And one of the ways that they come together is I was getting, I suppose, a little bit frustrated with, with critiques of the far right appropriation of freedom of speech, which concluded by saying, you know, the left or progressive movements need to reclaim freedom of speech as a progressive or emancipatory value. Now, clearly I agree with that. I wouldn't write a book. I wouldn't be part of these discussions if I didn't value, you know, the sort of the, the, the emancipatory and, and, and collective value of speech and public communication. But it's not enough to understand what's going on in terms of appropriation or hypocrisy and simply say, let's take it back. We need to understand the conditions under which freedom of speech has become a plausible modality through which certain kinds of politics are furthered. And central to that is a sort of a racializing politics that we need to explain in a number of different ways. That's great. Thanks a million. Um, so can I just kind of, I suppose, develop, ask you to develop some of those ideas. Um, there's just two things that you said there about free speech. So maybe, uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about that first and yeah. some of the points around all of that. Two things you said there, which I'd like to maybe ask you about. So how free speech are the no are the kind of the the right the idea of the right of the, of freedom to speak or speech is being used to amplify racist politics so can you tell us a little bit about how you think that that is happening i suppose yeah i mean i think it, it's it's i don't want to give a very long and complex answer that 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 yeah. too much at the start but i mean maybe one thing i could do is is talk a little bit first about what's going on with this very prevalent rhetoric of freedom of speech and then sort of blend the specific ways in which it amplifies racist politics mm -hmm. after that. So, I mean, because yeah. I, think it's, I think it's important to, um, precisely because freedom of speech is so important and precisely because it is such a favored topic of discussion in so many ways and such a, in contemporary terms, such an endlessly generative controversy, I want to be kind of clear about the ways in which I, I have approached it in the, the book, in other words, the ways in which, as I said, certain kinds of free speech crises end up being constantly reproduced. And so my, my, my starting point, as I said, was just to ask that question, which struck me as a kind of a media studies scholar, if you like, is why is there an apparent endless proliferation of free speech crises 
in a context of abundant communication. And by what which I mean by abundant communication is just obviously thinking of the ways in which in our everyday lives, we are, we are bombarded with sources that are competing for our attention and are communicating to us. So social media platforms as a business model are based on the endless solicitation of discourse. They want us to produce and to circulate speech broadly understood as communication. Um, we are able to have this kind of evening this evening because in a digitized uh, context, in a digital economy, bodies, institutions, agencies must all become more volubly communicative agencies, hosting debates, communicating to publics that they hope are out there to be communicated with. We obviously, everybody has their own experience of the proliferation of different kinds of media, journalism and so forth. So we exist in highly unevenly distributed and unequal access, unequally accessed um, um, a context of abundant communication. So the first thing I want to suggest is that, you know, it's not an accident that this rhetoric of freedom of speech proliferates in this context. It's partly a product of this environment because when we are communicating or attempting to mobilize or build publics or build uh, allegiances or just simply be heard in a context of endless churn and endless noise, claiming that one is being marginalized or being, or, or being silenced from this kind of imaginary center is a way of kind of generating attention, of hoping that you'll be the one who's heard, who's listened to, who's platformed, who can command attention. So we can, I can come back to those uh, mm -hmm. A little bit. But when I talk about a sort of context of abundant communication, I'm not saying that this equals an increase in freedom of speech, not at all, because it's also very clear that, you know, the sort of digital infrastructure that we now live in and has insinuated its way into our lives in lots of ways also brings with it multiple threats to, to, to liberty, to freedom, including freedom of expression, if we think of how surveillance works, if we think of how datification works. So in other words, what we're also have in the environment that we, the environments that we live in is many established but also emergent threats to freedom of expression, freedom of liberty, and so on. So I'm not for a moment in critiquing the way the freedom of speech is understood. I'm not for a moment uh, diminishing the kinds of threats to freedom of expression that exist. But I want us to have a more realist way of understanding them, if you like, which is to say this, when we, when, when we have, let me generalize a little bit, when we have discussions about freedom of speech, um, as they break out in public very often, very often two things happen. The first is there's, there's a debate about limits, um, you know, the metaphor of the slippery slope. Where will we put the limits? What will be the consequences of that? And it sets up a kind of an assumption that freedom of speech is something that we either have or we don't have. And then when we further debate it, there's often a sense in which what happens, something happens as a controversy, there's an incident, there's a conflict. And then there's an immediate, in that discussion, there's an immediate sort of switch to the principled level, to the kind of meta level, which is how applicable is the principle or not. And a lot of concrete experience, a lot of concrete social reality, if you like, gets lost in that sort of immediate switch to thinking about the principle and the applicability of freedom of speech. By which I mean, if we think about our everyday experiences of, of speech as communication, we're aware that we're subject every day to a mesh of restrictions, closures, coercions, but also possibilities, flows of communication, relations to communication. And that very much depends on our positionality. It very much depends on, on, on the kinds of access, the kinds of networks we have. But in other words, our, our, our existence in speech and communication is one of constant closure, foreclosure, coercion, restriction, as well as forms of openness and flow. So I think we need to start from that sort of realist assessment of how we live with speech and communication. And for me, what then happens, and one of the things that I really try to argue in the book, is the question then just doesn't become, is this about freedom of speech or not? Do we have it or not? But rather, what are the issues that be can become recognized as freedom of speech issues? What are the forms of coercion that can become recognized within the framework of a freedom of speech crisis? And that's, I suppose, what brings me into the question around racism, which is that in a whole complex set of ways, racism is very generative of these ideas that freedom of speech is in crisis. Whereas, you know, for example, one of the things I write about in the book is the proliferation of forms of anti-terrorist legislation that simply define 
whole areas of political speech as something other than speech, and they vanish off the terrain of, of, of freedom of speech crisis. We never hear them talked about um, other than by, by dissenting activists as a question of freedom of speech. So in a sense, that's what I mean. If we start by thinking in a more realist way about speech and communication and how they're distributed, and then start to ask the question of what can claim recognition as a free speech issue and what can't, then we get, I think, closer to, the, to, to some of the things going on politically right now. So I think that brings me back then. That's great. Thanks, Kevin. That brings us back to, can you, can you tell us kind of in very, in kind of practical terms, if you can, how you think that freedom of speech, those freedom of speech debates are, or how is that notion of freedom of speech being used to amplify a racist politics? How, and, and maybe why as well would be. Yeah. 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 I know you you mentioned there about, I suppose, the, the whole thing of generating attention. But yeah. uh, what, what else is going on or can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, because I think this is the other sort of, you know, big kind of uh, scaffolding in the book, you know, which I'll, I'll try to lay out a little bit because then it, you know, I, one of the things that that, of course, I look at in the book is there isn't one sort of wall of things happening here. There isn't one kind of wave. There's a lot of affinities between different sorts of politics that for a number of reasons meet or sort of get stitched mm. together through the politics of free speech. So, so I mean, to situate the question of, of, of racism and, and inevitably, you know, some of the reactions that, that I've had to this book is that it's an intervention kind of cancel culture style debates and that kind of thing. And um, I really didn't intend it to be, but I don't mind mm. it being seen as such. Mm. But the reason that I say that is a bit like the question of sort of hypocrisy. Um, if, if we take some of these sort of things that are happening all the time, we can take positions in relation to them. But again, I'm, in, I'm interested in what structures them, what makes them recur constantly as certain kinds of political or media spectacles. And one of the things that happens all the time in these sort of so-called so kind of so cancel culture, uh, I really, whoops, I'm uh, rebounding somewhere voice wise. Mm, I think you're okay again now. Okay now yeah, that's fine. Um, so one of the things that's, often at stake in these kinds of set pieces. And, you know, everybody I'm sure listening um, has a whole repertoire that they can supply themselves. But one of the things which is really central to understanding, I think what's going on is the way in which discussions of racism are very often framed that it is the accusation of racism or sometimes as now in the United States, that it's anti-racism as a whole, anti-racism to core, which is shutting down debate, is silencing legitimate concerns, is marginalizing uncomfortable truths. You just can't say things anymore. You can't say them honestly. You can't say them plainly. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a very established way of marginalizing anti-racism. If you look at, you know, debates from Powellism onwards in the UK, mm. for example, and the cliches about the race relations industry in the 1980s, this was about saying that anti-racism has become hegemonic and it's shutting down ordinary concerns and legitimate debate and so on. So there's an ideological sort of side to this, if you like. But there's been a real increase in this sort of sensibility that anti-racism is something which is censorious, that it silences things by making everything about racism. And it's this sort of dynamic that I was trying to, to explain in, in the sort of scaffolding of the, the, the book again. And again, to make it clear, we know there are lots of actors, and I, we've mentioned already sort of different sorts of far right or reaction reactors that use this as a political strategy. But in order to understand why the strategy has some kind of efficacy, I want mm. to try to explain its purchase. So one of, one, of, one of the contexts is again, a kind of communicative one. And again, I think this might be familiar to a lot of people, which is that anytime there's a story about racism or anytime somebody shares their experience of being racialized or subject to racism, or there's a t an attempted public mobilization around the question of racism, it becomes a sort of massively generative event. It becomes an invitation for people to adjudicate, well, we're all against racism, but is this racism or is this not? Mm. And so what happens is, is it generates a lot of kind of digital noise. It generates a lot of media noise, a kind of a storm of discourse. And I look at this in, in this book and in a previous book as a kind of silencing around being able to talk about racism, but it's a silencing through volubility. It's a silence through noise. It's a silence through the pretense that actually we're having all mm. of these kinds of debates about it. So on the one hand, you get this sort of, of, of 
you know, endless kind of debatability, not debate, but debatability, as I call it, this kind of noise, the cyclical noise in our circuits of, 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 of media about, well, is it, re yes, racism is bad, but is it really racism or is it not? But to understand that, we can't just put media at the center. We need to put what I call in the book, this kind of Western post-racialism at the center as well, which is, you know, to, to try to sum it up um, and not go, not go on about it at length, is I suppose a kind of very resilient, um, um, institutionally reproduced public mythology, powerful mythology, particularly in, in, in Western Europe and the US. So in, in that way, you know, some of my concerns in this book are very, are very parochial and very Eurocentric. But what I try to show is that in, in different countries, there's a very comparable story, which is that race understood exclusively as a sort of pseudo-scientific term uh, or, 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 or pseudo sort of body of pseudo knowledge is something which has been refuted in the post Second World War, post Shoah um, um, moment. That racism, particularly after the sort of defeat or, or collapse or marginalization of openly racist regimes such as, as Southern United States or, or, or apartheid South Africa, racism has also been marginalized. So of course racism still exists, but it's a question of individual prejudice. So it can be educated out. It's a question of bad ideas such as scientific racism. So they can be defeated, you know, in open debate, or it's actually just prejudice that anyone can have. So in fact, you know, people subject to historic forms of racialization can be racist because they can display prejudice against others. So to sum up, what, this, what, what I try to argue is that Post-racialism is actually a form of closure. It's a way of structuring and closing down speech because what it does is to enforce closure on what racism is. And it does it in a way which is very, very difficult to refute because what you have in, in this sort of official mythology of post-racialism is a kind of mea culpa. We were involved in certain forms of racism, but now they have been overcome. And therefore what's left, the remnant is these things. And unless you're talking about them, when you talk about racism, then you're making racism into absolutely everything. You're expanding the accusation in ways that shut down debate. And the problem for sort of anti-racism movements activists that try to mobilize understandings of racism as a way of acting, uh, acting against forms of racism, is that anti-racisms have always, there's a, a quote from, from Sivan Anden that I really like, which I, I, I just read out if that's all right to make the point, oh. um, writing in, in, in the early 1980s, where he says, look, racism does not stay still. It changes shape, size, contours, purpose, function, with changes in the economy, the social structure, the system, and above all, the challenges, the resistance to that system. So what he's doing there is emphasizing the historical nature of racism and the political nature of it, which means that it's always shifting. So if we take contemporary Islamophobia, for example, it didn't exist and it wasn't articulated in the ways it's articulated now when Sivan Anden was writing about racism in, 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 in those terms in the early 1980s. So for anti-racist activism, racism when understood as historical, as political, as something which is always shifting also through resistances to it, isn't amenable to one sort of given definition. But this post-racial mythology says, hey, unless you're talking about these things that we have agreed are bad and agreed are racism, then you're shutting down debate by making everything into racism. And I suppose that's the sort of base on which I try to show how different kinds of politics are enervated and amplified by that. Hmm. That's brilliant, uh, Gavin. I'll give you a second to catch your breath there. Um, <laughs> and just remind everyone that's listening that uh, we, we'd really love if you have any questions or would like to pick up on any points that you hear or ask for clarification about anything, please feel free to do that. Um, I think you brought, you're bringing us into kind of discussions there in greater detail about um, the kind of this, you have a section in the book about debating racism. And um, it's really interesting because uh, I, I have a, a kind of a, I suppose, um, I have problems myself with the whole idea of trying to find definitions of things. And you, you, you talk a lot about this idea that you, that there is kind of endless discussion around what actually is racism and you've, highlighted it there, mentioned it there. And some of the points that you make, I think are really interesting. And you do it in a slightly different language than maybe I've heard or, you know, in, in, in other contexts, like some people talk about structural racism or that, you know, you talk about the fact that racism isn't just ideas, not that it's not ideas, 
but it isn't just ideas. And that part of the problem, uh, I think you've just mentioned it there as well, is that when it's when racism is considered to be a set of ideas, then in what you call like in this marketplace of ideas, all ideas are valid. And therefore, it's very in some in some ways, it's very hard to to challenge kind of what what might by one person be seen or many people be seen as racist. Other other people will say, well, I'm not racist. I'm not racist, but this is what I think about whatever group of people. And uh, so I suppose I found in in reading the book that that kind of clarification that it isn't just a set of ideas and that linking racism to, as you just said there, histories, to politics, to technologies of racialization or racism, technologies in, I don't know, um, in government, in, in everyday life, basically. I found that very useful and very important, very important consideration. And um, so will you make some a little bit more comment um, on I suppose if somebody was to ask you, Gavin, what is racism? How how would you how would you address that answer? Uh, well, uh. that's that's uh, that's something that I kind of might work my way back around to because I think <laughs> yeah. you know, um I, I agree with you. I mean, one of one of the, you know, one of the things that, that kind of always interests me, um, and I suppose there's a there's a certain level of kind of optimism in in this as a as a set of public expectations, but there's also a certain kind of denial bound up in it as well which is that you know I think all of us recognize that you know we live in in a sort of media and orientate ourselves within a media environment and informational environment which has become in many important ways deeply deeply irrational deeply difficult to navigate where forms of sort of you know expertise and authority have become wildly relativized all of these kinds of things so within that, within all of the kind of constant sensation, within all of the constant sort of competition for attention, even within all of that, we still, or there's still, let's say, a language that we sometimes access about public debate, which has expectations about the capacities for, or, or potentials for dialogue, or potentials for shared understanding, or potentials for kind of forms of resolution or closure through the sort of you know, fora and mechanisms of debate that we also know have very, very little to do with our experience of the everyday media world. They do have something to do with our experience of interpersonal conversations or, you know, uh, discussion groups or, or, or forms of collective action. But they have very little to do, I think, with, with the sort of the, the mediated environment, the mediated public sphere, or to use that dreadful phrase, the marketplace of ideas, which is out there. And yet we're still very attracted to this notion of, of that, you know, let's just have the debate. And that will we, there will be greater understanding and from that will flow the possibilities for certain sorts of you know um, if not if not consensus then a more pluralistic sort of, 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 of mutual recognition or whatever it might be and then within that of course as well there is also that temptation that if we define something it will act as a kind of an anchor point in public discourse and if we agree on the definition then we can move on from that so you know I, like I said, I'm, I'm not averse to the kinds of hope that are invested in, in those ideas, but they are very idealist ideas. They do assume that ideas lead in all kinds of ways that, you know, don't make a lot of sense to me in terms of a kind of more political materialist approach to thinking about how media works, how politics works and, and so on. But what I try to argue in the book is that, and you use the idea of a kind of technology of racialization, and it's an interesting phrase because I, I try to argue that actually these sorts of assumptions unless we sort of think them through in relation to, in relation to concrete political relations, um, engaging with concrete political subjects, can become, for an example, a technology of racialization. And let me give you an example of what I mean by that. One of the, one of the books that I, that I reference um, in the book and like a lot is, is Rene Ido Lodge's book, um, Why I'm No Longer Talking About Race to, to White People. And the, the, the title is obviously sort of, you know, deliberately provocative. It's, it's, it's meant to resonate that notion of um, I'm, I'm not debating anymore. You know, I'm all of, all of those sort of anxious liberal fantasies about filter bubbles or about safe spaces. She's playing with all of those and saying, you know, I'm not talking. Uh, I'm also playing with, you know, with a, with a very sort of uh, identity politics style discourse saying, I'm no longer talking to, to, to white people about race. But I mean, of course she is. She's written a book. Uh, she talks endlessly. Uh, 
uh, to many different <laughs> people about that book, right? So the way I read that book is what she's trying to get at is that this sort of post-racialism I've been talking about, the idea that you can talk about racism, yes, because it's hegemonically understood that it's a bad thing, but you need to talk about it uh, under these conditions and in these ways, that she's rejecting that as a structure of, of closure, as a structure that restricts her freedom of speech in very, very important ways, restricts not just her ability, as she points out in the book, to talk about her experience of being racialized, but restricts her political agency as well in terms of how she and others can mobilize around the, the politics of anti-racism. So what she's, what she's trying to do there is to just reject this notion of foreclosure and actually say we need to think about you know um, what we really mean by debate what we really mean by forms of meaningful engagement and so forth so you know i think that that's one starting point for us to think about what, what it would and, and i think it's one of the things that i'm interested after having written this book to think about more which is what what in this kind of context what do meaningful forms of discourse and dialogue look like and under what conditions and through what kinds of relations but there's another important point you, you brought up, and that this moves me closer to the sort of the, the analysis of, 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 you know, active racist projects, if you like, uh, actively ideological racist projects in the book, which is, 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 is this, as you said, this notion where if, if racism is primarily understood as ideas of, as, a, as, an, as a question of ideas and ideology, and of course there ha have been and are, and at the moment are proliferating very enthusiastically um, and reproducing very successfully racist ideas and racist ideology. But if we primarily understand racism as a question of ideas and ideology, then it brings back the imperative to think about how one would debate them, disprove them, um, which in, um, sort of engage with them. Now, if you look at the kinds of, of many of the kinds of actors that I write about in the book, so, you know, for example, the, the reasons why um, very obviously sort of recognizably uh, uh, white supremacist actors like Richard Spencer or, you know, YouTube sort of racist stars that act as a kind of bridge point for, for, for racist movements while never actually joining or committing to them, why they all want to talk on university campuses, for example or why we have the, 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 the popularity now of a, of a discourse called viewpoint diversity in the United States, which is, let's just hear the sort of diversity. Um, let's not shut things down in a politically correct way. Let's make sure that pluralistically we hear all of the viewpoints. What these kinds of actors have cottoned on to is that if you agree, if you present yourself in these, you know, contradictory ways. On the one hand, you're, you know, active supremacist, but on the other hand, you're saying, hey, but I'm not racist. Racism is something that we've overcome. But we need to be able to have honest debates. We need to be able to have open inquiry. We need to be able to have honest conversations. And what that means is we need to be able to talk about uncomfortable things, but that they're true. So let's talk again, not about race, but let's talk about human biodiversity. Um, we need to be able to talk about, you know, um, the, the, the fact that, that, that some people are more involved in, apparently more involved in terrorism than others. Let's not talk about profiling, but let's talk about that in terms of, you know, certain kinds of religious essentialism or whatever it might be. So one of the things that happens in terms of these sort of post-racial suppositions is that, and especially on the internet, where we have a whole archive, a whole repertoire of, of racist artifacts and discourses and images and ideas, is that it's very easy to bring these things back and go, look, we know, and it's a very white we here, we know that, you know, we are not racist, but let's just have the debate, let's just consider these kinds of things as sort of honest uh, and legitimate objects of inquiry. And that's something which is very powerful at the moment because it wrongfoots the sort of operational assumptions and normative principles of, for example, um, journalists, of universities, of notions of, 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 I suppose, different ways of committing oneself to the notion that forms of pluralism have a democratic value. So what a lot of these very motivated actors are trying to do is to say, hey, you know, look, we just want our viewpoint to be heard as part of that spectrum of legitimate mm. debate. That's all we're asking mm. for. I, 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 that, that idea of, of what, constitute, what constitutes legitimate kind of uh, points of view or what can be said and what, what's considered to be legitimate to give voice to is a really interesting point that comes up in the book, I think. And yeah. I just want to get back a little bit to that, that thing about, 
And it's this it's a kind of an irony or a double bind that's going on. On the one hand, it's 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 like racism through through the inaction of notions of free speech. And on the other hand, you highlight very well how certain groups in particular are silenced. So that question about who's given voice, who actually can speak, what's what's considered legitimate to talk about and what's not. And it's it's without wanting to to kind of make it seem as if it's some kind of a conspiracy because it's not you're not in any way saying that but it's it's like in effect racism in effect delegitimizes certain voices and certain notions of what what's valuable um in ter- uh, that we can speak about and other and who can speak and others that are considered um not legitimate points of view that are that are uh, yeah, that are not not okay. Can you make any? Can you say anything more about that, or, or am I just putting what you've what you've just spent the last ten minutes saying into different <laughs> words, or getting it all wrong? No, not at all. No, I mean, and I think that that you know that it also it also does push us to th- to think about you know different different aspects of how you know how publics function um, right now. I mean, yeah, I mean, this there's some, there's a number of different ways into this because I suppose um, where what, what would be a good starting point? I mean, I suppose there's, there's, there's two ways I could talk about it. One is, you know, that there's a, there's a whole chapter in the book, which is very much about the sort of the political context of the, of, of the war on terror and the particular ways in which, you know, Muslims or Muslim looking people to use Ghassan Hajj's phrase have been racialized in particular kinds of ways mm. um, in relation to very sorts of, of, of um, a certain kind of civilizational politics, which has come to be very important in 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 Europe and the West more generally in this period. So, I mean, that's actually something I could maybe, if we come later to questions of you wanted to talk about some of this in relation to questions of sort of development and global justice, I could come back to you know that particular political moment there and talk about and talk about those issues. But in terms of the question of legitimacy now, I mean, w- one of the things that that um, that is, is deeply odd to me about the, the, the way in which freedom of speech is discussed is that people who, who and I'll be a little bit, um, um, uh, a little bit rhetorical here, but let's say people, people who make a, a big fuss about, about presenting themselves as classic liberals, as the idea goes, who are committed to um, the, the, the liberal heritage, as if there's any one single thing called the liberal heritage, and if it's mm. in, deeply complex in a lot of, 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 of ways and deeply conflicted in a lot of different ways, but they lay claim to this and say, look, you know, this is, this is, what, this is what we need to identify with. There just needs to be more speech. More speech equals, you know, the free flow of ideas. Um, this, the, the, the censorship or self-censorship of any kind means that we may never sort of, you know, encounter that idea that whether it be true or not forces us to revisit the truth of our ideas and all of these kinds of things which they then track back in the very crude versions you know, you'll get sort of Voltaire memes. Um, in the more sophisticated versions, you get a reference to, to J.S. Mill and so on. But what they what, what is often really left out of, of this sort of set of claims is that someone like Mill, for example, was, was not interested in freedom of speech as simply all of the stuff that you want to blur out of your mouth at a given moment. Instead, he was interested in the conditions under which the free flow of speech would produce the possibility of truth. And therefore, that happens under often very rarefied conditions, what's often called the sort of seminar room model, where people have engaged together with a set of, um, so obviously it's also a way of thinking about speech which is exclusive, which can, can be elitist, but where at least speech takes place on the basis of shared openly declared suppositions and orientations as to how we're going to engage with each other. In other words, what's called a truth orientation. Now, the problem is when we take that into the, the wilds of the contemporary sort of media environment, there are many, many orientations at play, uh, including a truth orientation, but not only. There is the, the orientation to claim attention, to trawl, to disrupt, all of these different kinds of things as well. So for me, the question about, of legitimacy, um, and this is often reduced in a way that isn't helpful to whether we engage in good faith or bad faith. Mm-hmm. The question of legitimacy 
comes down to how we begin to analyze the different ways in which these forms of orientation overlap with each other in the public sphere. So let me give you, give you an example of, of, of what I mean by that, and particularly in relation to, to arguments about, about racism. Um, when, when, and it's one of the things that, that you know, is, is essential to what Rene Ido Lodge is saying as well, which is that why should we treat very well-known tropes or mythologies or stereotypes or forms of rhetoric or talking points that circulate on the internet, why should we treat these as having a certain kind of truth orientation? Mm -hmm. In other words, when we encounter uh, people in debate, we are encountering the endless proliferation of digital noise. A lot of stuff that you encounter on Twitter is generated by machines. There's actually no sort of human agent necessarily behind it. Why? Should we treat all of these articulations as having a truth orientation? And can we, in fact, because if we did and we're compelled to agree with them, we'd spend our entire time on, on Facebook threads or whatever it might be. So we need to start to think about the question of legitimacy, I think, not just in, in, in terms of if something is articulated by somebody, speech is an expression of their conscience and therefore it's legitimate in and of itself, but to think more about, about, about discourse, to think more about the ways in which the noise that I'm talking about is a product of the endless repetition of similar kinds of points. And so there is no obligation on any of us to engage in good faith or to replicate the seminar room model of legitimate discourse in relation to talking points that we have, have, have heard or when we, we think about sort of clever and coded forms of racism, why should there be any obligation on somebody who is racialized and living with various forms of racist structuration in their lives? Why should it be up to them to engage in some sort of debate on this? But very often what happens, and this is the thing of course that Edo Lodge is trying to somehow poke at and satirize, what happens is that people are expected to have the debate as if the world starts afresh every morning, as if there aren't histories to these discourses, as if it isn't clear what the motivations of certain kind of actors is. And for me, that's a very naive way of thinking about the legitimacy of speech in the contemporary public realm. I think if we want to broaden in the debate about racism, if we want to reclaim modes of meaningful public communication, we need to get a lot better at being able to say, these kinds, these sorts of these sorts of debates are not part of that because there's something else going on here, which is is politically not just motivated but politically generative in all of these kinds of ways, which are unhelpful. Mm. Um, thanks. That brings me kind of into thinking about some of these issues more broadly in the context of um, kind of uh, social media and and you you talk about like. Reconceptualizing, reconceptualizing, sorry, ideas of public dialogue under conditions of communicative abundance. And you've talked about it earlier about noise and all that. Just one very quick question. Um, I'll, I'll come to it now in one second. Sorry, somebody made a point. I just want to highlight it there. And please feel free if anybody wants to bring in anything, we'll, we'll raise it. Uh, somebody said in the chat, Gavin, that at the same time you have a sort of post-racial ideology, you also have the largest ever pro-migrant protests in US history in 2006, and then in the last while, then Black Lives Matter as well. So you might want to comment on that uh, either now or later. Yeah, um, just, just to clarify, of course, yeah. you know, to, to, to describe something as, as, as a way of trying to lay out this sort of understanding of, of how a sort of post-racial ideology permeates certain kinds of debates. Uh, my reason for referring to Sivanandan was to talk about the ways in which, you know, racism and racist structures are shifted by the forms of opposition and mobilization against them, which they encounter. So it's, obvi it's, it's obvious that I'm not talking about what I think I should perhaps have clarified it, but I think it's not to talk about a set of hegemonic assumptions or easily reproduced assumptions is not in any way to marginalize the extent of, uh, of, of, of how they are being um, contested and the extent of mobilization, not just against forms of discourse, but for very particular you know, material real forms of migrant justice, anti-racist justice and so forth. So yeah, I mean, factoring in much more of that kind of antagonism and much more of that complexity into the picture is definitely something we have to do. Yeah, great, thanks. So I just wanted to get back then to kind of looking a little bit more at this kind of conditions of communicative abundance. And, and a very specific question you mentioned, you said we shouldn't feel under any obligation to engage in, in certain forms of debate because on the basis that they uh, represent a kind of, or come from a truth orientation that they may not, and they often don't, 
And I suppose lots of people, you know, wonder about, you know, the value of directly, directly challenging, you know, uh, racist statements on social media and, you know, taking on people, calling them out. What, what, what's your own view or take on all of that? Yeah, I mean, my, my own view on, on that is, I suppose, that this takes us more towards a realm of maybe strategic and, and, and tactical questions, which will look mm. a little different according to, you know, the, according to the individual actor we're, we're, we're talking about and their exposure, you know, to, to, um, to, to the consequences of, of these kinds of debates or issues or the sort of agencies we're talking about, whether we're talking about Kolov or, or somebody else. I suppose what, what I mean by this sort of no obligation to, to engage is mm. to try to, again, to come back to some of these sort of, um, as I said, these sort of very understandable, but also somewhat frayed democratic assumptions that are invested in certain imaginaries of debate. In other words, that to debate in public is to be part of, of the polity, is to be part of the public sphere, and is to, you know, intrinsically advance um, and democratic, democratic aims and goals, pluralistic aims and goals, and so on. But the question then becomes when, when we have, for example, on social media, when we have platforms who are commercially oriented to producing a, the ever, an ever sort of increasing abundance and density and velocity of debate, whether those same kinds of normative values hold in the same kind of ways for us as individuals, for institutions, for political movements or whatever it, it might be. So the, the, the point about being under no obligation to engage, I think is a very much a kind of a very practical one. If, if, we're, expo if we're constantly exposed to endless demands on our attention and endless demands to produce data through engagement, we have every right to decide which debates are meaningful and which are not in very much the same way that we do this with interpersonal conversations or whatever it might be. Mm. But the tactical element I think comes in um, where, where, or the strategic element comes in when we think about, you know, the way in which debate and dialogue interaction operates and plays out on social media platforms. And one of the things that happens on social media platforms is they are, they are primed, they are set up, they are organized to be generative. In other words, there's never closure. There is always uh, the possibility for more circulation, more discourse, the production of more opinion, more controversy, more spectacle, and so on. So it can be very important to take a stand in public and to you know, refute something on, on, on social media, particularly, for example, if it's by somebody who has a lot of you know, power or public profile or whatever it might be. But we must also be aware that when we do that, we're involved in something which becomes generative, which will produce, mm. if you like, more of the same or, or, or different. And that there may be costs involved in that for not, not just for us, but for, you know, but for the people we are attempting to stand in solidarity with who became, may become, for example, more, uh, more targeted, more abused, more likely to be driven mm. off the platform or whatever it might be. So, so I suppose this is, this is what I mean about this being something of a strategic question. And for me, it depends very much not on how refutable the arguments are, because I think, again, a lot of arguments that are, that are, are a lot of discourse, which is racializing, is not something which is open to being refuted in the way that we associate with sort of, you know, public debate. But there are publics who are, who are watching. There are sort of publics or constituencies out there who need to see that these ideas are confronted, who need mm -hmm. to be directed towards resources or viewpoints or, or alliances that can help them to you know, understand and move past these particular ideas themselves. So that's what I mean about the strategic element, if you like, that they're, they're not to take the notion of public dialogue at face value does not mean that there are not valuable publics which are there to be sort of won over and who are there to be to be convinced. Mm. Speaking of which, uh, somebody has just put in a, that's great, thanks Gavin. Uh, somebody has just put in a, a comment, uh, Annetta, thanks very much for that. Um, it's a question, if racism is shifting and uh, thinking in terms of publics and responding and that kind of stuff, also as a response to the resistance to it, what are the recent shifts that you see aside from Black Lives Matter? that provoked such vigorous opposition to limits of free speech. Does that make sense to you? Uh, not entirely. Um... Yeah, so basically what recent shifts are you seeing, which um, basically have, I suppose, provoked such an opposition to the limits of, of free speech? 
So what, what are the shifts that are going on in terms of racism as you see them? Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't actually get, I, I don't actually get the, who, who, who's, maybe I could ask a clarifying question for Annette yeah. or for you, yeah. which, which, whose opposition to the limits of free speech? I mean, maybe, maybe mm. an example of, of, an example before I give my own examples, but I'm just not sure of the, the relation which has been mm -hmm. the question. Okay, we leave that for Annette there to come back Apologies. to us, maybe. I, I, yeah, yeah, no, no, it's, it could be in my interpretation of what's written there. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about just the kind of the internet, I suppose, and social media. And I think, I think you, your, 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 dis, your discussion there, your, your, your talk about, you know, how we engage in debate and what debates we engage in and that idea of, you know, engaging in social media being very generative, and yet that there is strategically, I suppose, there, is, there are not only arguments to be won, but there are publics to be won over. I think you said that or something similar. Um, I find that really interesting and very important. And it brings us back to that kind of calling people out, but not necessarily having to, having to fall into the terms of the debate as decided by others. Um, so, like, I know there are so many issues around this, and you talk about it a lot in the book, um, Gavin, and it's really interesting, but maybe could you just maybe make a brief comment, because I, 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 I imagine more questions will come in. Could you make a brief comment about whether or not you think the internet and social media adds to kind of racialization, um, or to what extent do you think it oper offers opportunities uh, to challenge it, um, or both. Yeah, I mean that's it's a great question, and it's it's kind of a, it's kind of a huge one in the sense yeah, that I know. I, Sorry. Yeah. No, no, it's it's, it's good because <laughs> I, I think um, one thing I'm 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 conscious of of as well, you know, and, that, and I've been talking um, in ways that could easily sort of slide into or be interpreted as you know a very dystopian. Um, uh, narrative as to where we are with with the digital media landscape, and and I wouldn't want to give that impression at all for 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 two reasons. One, because that you know there's there's, there's simply no point in in such broad brushstrokes, but also um, I think we need to approach you know technology platforms, the kind of infrastructure of of, of connection which has been um, uh, which has. Come upon, seems to have come upon us, obviously it hasn't come upon us very quickly, but seems to have insinuated itself into social, political, uh, cultural life in ways which are, are still catching um, um, people sometimes a bit, by, a bit by surprise, which is I suppose why some of our, you know, normative vocabulary for debate, dialogue, these kinds of things are still sort of catching up with our practices, with our intuitive sense of what's possible and, and what isn't possible. Um, but I suppose within, within that, the way to, for me, the way that makes sense to approach these, these, these platforms, technologies, connections, is that they are loaded with ambivalence, that they will always do not either or, but both and at the same time. So if we think about, you know, something like, in, in the question just to, res to, to respond to the reference to the most recent iteration of Black Lives Matter. One of the things which was, you know, so interesting in, 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 the, in the aftermath of just that, that first wave of, of, of protest and insurrection in the United States was the sort of energy that it created in, in Black Lives Matter solidarity protests in, in other countries as well. Um, and obviously that was something which was made possible by you know, these infrastructures of connection and mobilization. And what happened very much within that politics, which was, is really interesting in terms of this discussion of post-racialism as well, is that if you, if you remember in the aftermath of, of, of you know, the first week or so of protests, the great and the good of, of European politics were lining up to, to say Black Lives Matter and to, to condemn you know, police mm. brutality in the United States, um, including, for example, Emmanuel Macron in France. But when Emmanuel Macron was then conf confronted with the biggest mobilization in the, in the history of the French state, to the best of my knowledge, against police violence, um, which was the product of existing and heavily repressed movements against police violence in France that took that moment to mobilize in a new way. Well, immediately Macron said, well, of course, no, 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 there's no police violence here because, 
police are the agents of the universal republic and there is no racism. Um, when in Ireland, again, politicians lined up to talk about Black Lives Matter, but when protests were held that linked, not just in solidarity with protesters in the States, but what linked the Black Lives Matter politics to the particular ways in which direct provision works to racialize asylum seekers as a kind of problem population, the Irish political class, again, was to say, well, no, 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 that, the racism is over there, it's not here. So, you know, that's one of the things I've been talking about in terms of this sort of resilience of this kind of post-racial horizon. Racism is always somewhere else. It's always bad and it's somewhere else, but it doesn't exist here. But what the structures of connection facilitated in terms of the sort of mobilization was an ability to sort of make those connections and to say, yes, but it is happening here too. And here are the people that you actively marginalize and here are the people that you actively repress. Now that obviously happens because movements are able to both use and also harness and mobilize through these kinds of infrastructures. And that's what I mean about thinking about them as ambivalent. But at the same time, it's obviously clear in a whole range of ways that this sort of connective infrastructure um, favors, I would say in many ways favors reactionary and racist politics in particular mm. ways. And it's difficult to explain this in, in, in a very short, short mm. summary. So let me try a short summary of what I mean, um, and then we can unpack it a little bit afterwards. When, when we think about sort of progressive or emancipatory or anti-racist politics, they, they, they benefit from collective capacities to generate collective meanings that people can mm. own and understand and mobilize through. And when you have a very fragmented uh, and individualizing media structure, that becomes more difficult to, 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 to sustain in certain kinds of ways. If your political project is much more effective, is much more about revenge fantasies, mm -hmm. is much more about a sort of, of imaginary horizon of how the nation should be and who the real people who belong are and who is valued and who is not, then that fragmentary sort of landscape is, is much more productive from you because you can meme your way through it. You can pick out different quotations mm -hmm. from it. You can decide to pick on a particular activist or a particular uh, news source mm -hmm. or a particular story. You don't need ideological uh, collective coherence in the same kind of way because the coherence that you mm -hmm. have comes from certain sort of um, deeply held imaginative projects about you know, the, the ethno-national nation or the race family or the European civilization or whatever it might mean. Mm. And within that, you can cope with lots of sort of what we'd see as sort of irrationality or what we might see as a lot of contradiction because they help you advance your occupation of public space. They help you advance the generativity of your politics by forcing people to decide whether they're going to engage with them or not. So that's why I think there's something about the way in which the speed, the immediacy, the fragmented, constantly recursive, circuitive nature of how digital media systems work, that at the moment is, is, is to some extent amplifying um, um, reactionary and racist projects, groups, mm. movements in a whole variety of ways that we're still trying to understand. That's brilliant, Gavin. Thanks very much. I, th I think that, that made a lot of sense to me, what you were saying. It's kind of like because of the the way it works, so it's in it's a it's in its effect. It's not. I think you described it earlier on in itself. It's a neutral thing, but it's in how it how it it's it, the effect of the way that social media works. It can work in the favor of kind of reactionary politics. Yeah. Um, just back to that question from Anetta, she wanted to talk about actually more about uh, social media and basically I suppose about the influence and I have two questions for you on this or related to it, the influence of the companies that own, you know, this kind of the internet space and social media spaces or own and control. So you may have feel that you've kind of addressed that or is there anything else you want to say about yeah, that? No, I, just I can, hold on one sec. Can I give you the other question as well? Yeah, I, I can see the chat. Actually. I've just opened it up so I can see. Oh, the, you can actually see them. Oh, that's yeah, brilliant. Can now and, then, and then there's another question from Colin about. Yeah. And there's one there from there's one there from Tom O'Connor, which is about Emmy Palmer. And uh, actually, others can't see them, the chat. So I'll just call them out if you don't mind, but you can be yeah. reading them. So, uh, oh, yeah, maybe you can all see it on, on YouTube. But anyway, I'll, I'll read it out. So from Tom, there's been protests against Emmy Palmer, who's the former general director of the Israeli Ministry of Justice, uh, that she's been appointed as censor in Facebook. Uh, 
and a fear that she'll censor pro-Palestinian expression. Should we worry about censorship in, from the tech giants? And then I think this idea then from Colin around political correctness, you might want to comment on that. Yeah, yeah, certainly. I mean, I see there's a couple of, 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 of questions there um, from Colov office and, and then from Tom. Yeah, I mean, I think, and, and this is, you know, this is a debate where, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of people Pre present that I can see who are who, who are much more up to date on some of these specific issues than me and, and also on these debates but I would I would make a very general comment where I agree absolutely I think um, I I think the big problem I mean if we start with the sort of the, the, whoa, that's my office window is kind of good if I if I start with the everything in Maynooth is automated these days so you never know what the robot is going to do so that was the window robot or right, anyway if if we start with the headline issue, as far as I'm concerned, the biggest problem underlying many of the things that I've been talking about here, um, to, to move slightly away from this, the, 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 the thematic uh, set of issues that we've been looking at, is that we are so dependent for um, the public infrastructure of discussion, um, co-creation, mobilization, um, uh, shared understanding we're so dependent for that public infrastructure on private companies so it's obviously not a public infrastructure it's a pseudo public infrastructure it performs certain kind of public functions functions that we find ways of using uh, um, um, in, in a public spirited way like using youtube for this or whatever it might be but ultimately um, this is both the, 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 this is the gift of unaccountable, democratically unaccountable corporations. And I think there's a lot we could, we could specific critiques we could make of, 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 of these corporations. And I think that it would be uh, fair to say both that they are um, more or less uninterested um, in, in, in the question of, of, you know, the viability or future of, 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 of any kind of progressive politics on their platforms, they're interested in maximizing engagement, mm. uh, content circulation and datification. Um, and they will always have, you know, very plausible um, kind of discursive um, 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 presentation as to their commitment to diversity and pluralism and freedom of speech and so forth. But ultimately, as private corporations, um, they have provided us with these sort of machinic infrastructures that, we can sometimes use um, uh, on a daily basis or in political ways for our own ends and they can have um, collectively valuable results. But we're also completely at the mercy of, of unaccountable uh, corporations in which to do so. Mm -hmm. um, and what that means, I think, is that the, for me, the debate about the critique of, of, of these, you know, uh, these corporations needs maybe collectively we need to start reorienting it to thinking about how we can also build up the resources of our own communicative spaces and possibilities uh, and infrastructures um, as well and um, both in terms of, of, of you know things like this but more thinking about you know what would what would as public service media or public service broadcasting as we understand it right now, as it collapses essentially, um, mm -hmm. what would a public service media infrastructure look like that isn't vested say in RTE as one sort of mm -hmm. central institution, but is about finding ways of, of facilitating and supporting and encouraging very diverse kinds of publicly funded, publicly oriented um, um, interaction, communication, content creation outside of the sort of gilded cage of, of the private corporation. So, you know, I think we could have a whole first, mm. first Wednesday, first Thursday, first Friday on, on, on that, on how to, how to both take our critique of, of what's happening with these corporations, but move it into, you know, what do we need to produce our own, me what used to be called mediating institutions, those places where we can, you know, create ideas and, and, and praxis, if you like. Um, just then to, to, to Colin's point, yeah, absolutely. I think it's very important to point that out. Um, and, and, I made a brief reference to this earlier when, when I was talking about the sort of the histories of, 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 of anti-racism being regarded as censorious or the kind of tact, the history of tactics of trying to marginalize anti-racism as, as overweening, as overreaching. Um, of course, we know that there are 
because they've become so resurgent again, well-established historical discourses around political correctness, for example, um, which find different sort of expressions in more contemporary idioms around, around cancel culture or being canceled or whatever it might be. But again, the, so th there's, a sort, there's a sort of consistency in this, in this political tactic that Sarah Ahmed, for example, described very, very well once where she, you know, where she tried to say that what happens is that the you know, the, the hegemonic tactic is to make it look as if, you know, those who are contesting their oppression are actually the ones who are hegemonic. Um, mm -hmm. And they're the ones who are setting the terms of the debate. And you're just trying in your plucky little way to, 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 to say something courageous. I think the difference or what has happened to, you know, these debates about, about political correctness and the way they've become uh, uh, um, re, re, vigorated through notions of cancel culture and so on has got again to do with how we understand the sort of the the, the dynamics of 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 the sort of the digital public the digital public realm um if you take for example the idea of 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 you know the contrarian and we can we can all think of the sort of you know the media contrarians the people who are always on hand to say something you know i know this is going to be unpopular i know they're going to try and censor me for this i know i'm going to be you know called a racist but it has to be said um they are able to operate and consistently reproduce themselves by 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 simply um depending on the speed and circulation of churn to allow them to reposition themselves, you know, the next day or the day after in relation to the exact same talking points and the exact same sort of performance mm -hmm. of being censored or marginalized or subject to political correctness or whatever it might be. So it's very clear that the sort of the grift around this has, has been structured into the political economy of, of comment and debate and opinion and so on. But there's, I think there's something else kind of, 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 of going on, which is that it shouldn't surprise us, let's say something more profound than just the kind of chancers that I'm talking about. Um, it shouldn't surprise us that language becomes so central to controversies in a highly mediated, highly accelerated, mm -hmm. highly discursive public realm. Because of course, what happens in that context is that different languages, different ways of constructing a, a, an issue or a problem, different way of excluding aspects of that issue or problem are colliding with each other in, in accelerated and sometimes unpredictable ways. So one of the responses of forms of hegemonic expression to that has been to say, you know, nobody will engage with the issues anymore. It's all about the critique of language. It's all about correcting how we should mm. talk about things. But what's being denied there is that there is an accelerated collision between, if you like, discursive communities that were previously, if not kept separate, but were previously much easier for you know, dominant communities to ignore or to marginalize or to pretend that they, they don't exist. And one of the ironies of that is that you know, the flip side of these sort of debates is a critique of, well, you know, why can't people just robust, robustly engage with the ideas? They want to hive off in their safe spaces and not have the debate and so forth. So on the one hand, what goes on in these kind of cancel culture debates is to say, I refuse to recognize what's happening in an altered, accelerated uh, and very, very antagonistic public space. And then at the same time say that everybody has to play in that space or they're being, un and they're being undemocratic or they're in the thrall of identity politics or whatever it might be. So it might really be actually when we think about some of these dynamics that, you know, a politics of reconstruction is to say we actually need more safe spaces, we need more filter bubbles, we need more echo chambers in the sense that I don't think any of these things exist in the way that they're, they're discussed in cliched terms, but in the sense that we need to be able to construct in so much as we think that this is about discourse and the exchange of ideas, we need to be able to construct viable uh, discursive communities that are not constantly sidetracked um, by these sorts of, of, of dynamics. So the, the idea of political correctness has always been a nice kind of uh, 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 tactic because what it does is it plays a discourse game. It's a language game itself, but it says, hey, look, I'm the one who just wants to speak freely and honestly, they're the ones who are actually playing the language games. Um, what's happening, I think, right now is that language games are an inevitable part of the way in which the sort of flow of, of, of content and interaction with each other takes place. Great, Gavin, thanks very much. Um, uh, just going to wrap up in the next uh, few minutes with just a couple of areas uh, that I'd like to ask you to talk about. And uh, you, I suppose the first one is sparked by that whole idea of language games and 
discourses. And I, I'd like to kind of just throw a few ideas out about the relevance of the book and about, I suppose, debates about racism in thinking about development and development practice. And I, I think a few of the points that you made about racism and communication and discourse in the book really resonated with me. The whole thing about racism not necessarily being obvious, overt racism, or even in the name of anything related to ethnicity or race, but that it's in, it can be imbricated in policy and practice and come in the guise of benevolence. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in, I suppose, what people what what can be done for other people can often be you know a replicating of racialized uh, division and and distinctions and uh, I I've been kind of I suppose thinking very much about the relative lack of of debate about racism in development practice now many theorists and many develop, international development thinkers have addressed questions overtly about, you know, is international development racism, racism in development representations, racism through kind of volunteering practice. There's a, there are a range of kind of articles or discussions or debates that have happened. And there was a recent one about the influence of Black Lives Matters on kind of uh, the international development community in the UK and how it might shift ways of thinking or talking or language, that kind of stuff. Um, and these days, most kind of critique of uh, related to all of this kind of comes in the form of um, decoloniality and questions about the neocolonialism of development discourse and development practice. And I just wondered if if you'd like to kind of comment on this from from your point of view, how you think a kind of I suppose these questions about uh, how about racism, about uh, understandings and definitions of racism, but also how it intersects and and relates to questions about communication and communication power and social media. How that how that um, yeah how it how it is relevant for or how it might speak to um, development representations or development thinking and practice these days. Sorry, it's just a small question <laughs> for five minutes. Like, yeah, um, <laughs> sorry, I have to have to think where to 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 start with with that one. Um, I mean, I suppose I don't I don't address debates about about decolonization um, in in the mm. book, um, and and if I did, I I would talk explicitly about you know a much more active notion of decolonization rather than you know the idea of the decolonial or whatever might be, which I'm not always sure um, what that's meant to refer to. But I think if I were to, to, to talk, to try to talk through or to think through some of, of the, 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 the dynamics of the, you know, the, the not quite colonial and imperial, yet still quite enthusiastically colonial and imperial world, and then the status of debates about, about, about decolonization. Um, within it, I think my, my my starting point would be some of the things you know which which I spend a lot of time on in the book, which haven't come up in our, in our discussion yet, but something that had interested me for for many years uh, and motivated me for many years before before I wrote about them in this form, which is the ways in which um, uh, liberal liberal values. Um, Enlightenment values, to use again an, another tricky short shorthand, have become very central to certain sort of processes of, of, of governmentality and have become ways of using um, universal, the sort of promise of universal ideas to restore particular forms of Eurocentrism, which have found themselves challenged by, precisely by, not just the sort of advent of a multipolar world, but challenged by much more strongly in many contexts, challenged by very active uh, decolonial, anti-colonial, and anti-racist movements who are, are who are, are focused also very much on, you know, as we've seen recently, the sort of the, the, the built environment, the, the the question of memorialization and heritage to statues and other things, but also thinking about the nature of of, of the, the, the the colonial nature of of the nation state, and so I mean. Just to maybe give a short summary of, of because I don't really feel too 
to qualify at this time of, of the night to start thinking of it in terms of, of development education and, and, and development politics, particularly for an audience such as this one. But what one of the things that is very important to me about this book is to particularly also when, when the focus is on, is on reactionary movements, is on the far right, is on authoritarian nationalists and so on. One of the things that's very important for me in this book is to emphasize that much of the ground um, for their appropriation um, or their productive use of the politics of free speech has been laid by, um, has been laid down by um, nominally liberal uh, rep representative democracies, center right and center left governments in the period since 9-11, since obviously not magically starting there as a threshold, mm -hmm. but intensifying very much afterwards. And in that period, one of the things that has happened, which has been absolutely toxic, and which if we, if we want a progressive project of reclaiming a freedom of speech, we need to be absolutely clear about how this has happened. One of the things which has happened in that period is the notion, uh, or is, is, is rather a politics whereby liberal and universal values have been declared to be not nationally specific. Um, if people want to come to this country, if people want to migrate, if people want to be religious minorities in this country, which always means Islam, Muslims, mm. then we're not talking about people integrating to a national culture. We're talking about people integrating to just these common values, these basic values, these liberal values, which are part of our modus vivendi, and everybody can live together through them. And as we know, and as we've experienced in lots of different ways, what has happened in this, in this period is that those values have been weaponized in very particular ways. In other words, what has happened is there's a politics of benevolent racism, as you describe it, which says, all we expect from you is that you will stick to uh, minimally adhere to these values. So what we're going to do is keep you under surveillance and keep you under constant public suspicion and debate you and debate your intentions and debate your identity and debate your religion and debate your loyalty continually in public until such time as we're sure that you are capable of adhering to these values. So freedom of speech has been absolutely central to this. And, and so I, I write in the book a lot about the, the, the Danish cartoons crisis, the Ulands Poston crisis, or more, more recently in 2015 with Charlie Hebdo and everything that happened after that. That what this allowed European governments to do was to sort of put forward a very, very um, racialized Eurocentric pedagogy um, whereby they said, you need to prove to us that you're capable of respecting freedom of speech. But the way that you do that is you need to prove to us that you're capable of being offended. And under that license of offense as something emancipatory or offense as proof of one's democratic health uh, and temperament or offense as proof of one's capacity to live in, in a robust democracy, under that license of offense, Muslim populations have been racialized as democratically inferior, as culturally and religiously intolerant or different, and in ways, of course, that have a massive impact on, you know, the heterogeneity and the internal dynamics and debates between different Muslim groups, activists, and others. So if there's, if there's a point of connection between, you know, the things you're interested in and what I'm interested in this book, is the way in which a sort of very, very virulent and reinvigorated Eurocentrism has been very central to the politics of, of migrant integration, of, of, of post-multicultural integration, and all of these kinds of things over the last 20 years by saying to people, prove to us that you have the capacities to be as we already are. In other words, we, we, we're fine with being offended. Uh, we respect freedom of speech because we're born into these political cultures. You need to prove to us that you are capable and that you are willing to be the same kind of political subject. And that is absolutely the structure of benevolent racism in Europe because it speaks the language of, of good things. It speaks the language of positive values. It speaks the language of integration. But what it does is single out people as a problem population and say, you'll never actually be fully integrated because we're going to keep asking you to prove to us that you are integrated. And that sort of, you know, th that, that, that sort of focus, that lens, that surveillance is never going to go away. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think that's probably, you know, I've got, I know I've gone way off sort of uh, off question here. And it's also because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of brain dead at this. At this stage. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, uh, on that, I, I think I, I think that that's yeah. the, that's that's where just to sum up, that's where the sort of decolonial uh, politics is, is so useful and so powerful to unpick the way in which these Eurocentrisms have been reinvigorated under the sign of the universal. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. Thanks so much. Um, I know there's lots and lots of other areas that we could talk about, but also I'm I'm conscious that you've kind of been on under the spotlight now for an, an over an hour, and it's uh, quite a long time. Um, I think that there's so much in the book. This is this is the book for those of you who are still with us. There's so much in it. There is real, um, really uh, kind of a complex but really nuanced understanding and insight about these these debates and how they interrelate. And I know it speaks to other work that you have done in the past. And I think there's loads and loads of challenges there for us to kind of to unpack, as they say, and to to look at what are the implications for for activists, for solidarity workers, for people concerned about uh, direct provision, about the way migrants are treated in Ireland. It's, it's like there's so much in it, really. And I hope what we've done in the discussion is to kind of, I suppose, open that, open that uh, window into the book and into your ideas, Gavin, which I think is a, it's a really accomplished piece of work. And I really would like to, you know, to commend you for it. But I hope that we haven't uh, given people too many spoilers and that uh, people would actually <laughs> go and buy it, go and get a copy of it or borrow it in a library. Better again, even get the libraries to, um, to stop the, it. The, the only spoiler is actually answering the question, you know. Yeah, is, yeah. <laughs> is, is there, yes or no, you don't find out on, on, until the yeah, end. Yeah, I actually, I have, down, have it down here in my notes, the very last question. I was going to say, so is free speech racist? But I won't even... Um, I won't even go there. I suppose it's my, you know, after all my sort of uh, high, high-minded high discussion of, of how, you know, trolling and, and disruption works, it's my my own little private sort of trolling moment is, is the question itself, because it's sort of, it's obviously not a real question. It's a kind of ventriloquism. Um, yeah. If you can imagine, imagine um, uh, what's your man, that dreadful British actor, uh, Lawrence Fox, uh, who's just set up, you know, his free speech party or whatever it is. You could, if you imagine, it, it, if you pose the question in his voice, you'll have a sense of the kind of ventriloquism that I was I was playing around with there. You know, what even now is is, is even free speech racist? Mm. Um, yeah, anyway, <laughs> that's, the, that's the backstory. So, so uh, thanks so much for your in, in really incredible contributions this evening. It was really, really interesting. It's brilliant. Thanks so much. Um, uh, Mark in Kolov has asked me to remind everyone who's still with us to like, share the video and subscribe to the Kolov channel. And hopefully we'll see you back here at uh, next first Wednesday.